Hey again, everyone. How goes it? Kind of heavy subject material today. Sorry if I look a little peaked. Sleep schedule's been a bit funny, but at the same time, my lighting rigs have all gone to shit. So, let's get on with this. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubt and tilt. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't be otherwise. So, once again, welcome back. As I said, this topic is going to be something that's a little heavy. Now, I know I say that, and you might think to yourself, well, I mean, it's not exactly though the rest of it's been like, you know, chewing gum, but today's topic, as you probably figured out from the title, is self-loathing. Now, this is an interesting topic, I feel, because it's something that um, I've had personal experience with, seen a lot of other people struggle with and have personal experience with, but moreover, there's a sort of, I suppose, maybe you could call it a pathology to it that I've found kind of interesting recently while meditating on the topic and also while going through some things which sort of forced all this thought and consideration to the surface. So a little anecdote I suppose and then we'll get into why any of what I'm about to say in this story matters. So a good place to start I suppose would be around like 16, 17 years of age. I was just coming out of my my younger teen years, driving about and all of this, and um, at that same time, that was when the inevitable happened to my household. Parents got divorced, family split up, all went different ways. Now, at this point, we, my brother and I, we'd been waiting for this to happen for so long, we just figured it was, but afterwards, there was, of course, a sort of mourning period for the life that I'd previously had, one which was, you know, a sort of suburban stability, security, comfort, those sorts of things. Now, following this and being thrust not only into the real world, but also into poverty, um, right off the bat, I did naturally have these inclinations over time to start thinking in perhaps wrong terms, uh, which sort of came about to the conclusion that I was somehow to blame. Now, we hear this a lot, now, and, and these kind of stories, I mean, this isn't unique to me, and I don't mean for this to be some sort of pity party video, it's not. But, you know, throughout the course of our lives, we all endure suffering. We all encounter things which sometimes tear our worlds down entirely, and whether it is or is not our faults, or regardless of what level of responsibility we might actually bear for the outcomes of the situations which affect us. It is fair to say that there seems to be a sort of natural human tendency to do that. Now it is funny too because oftentimes when you hear someone perhaps discussing some suffering, some tragedy, some trauma that they've experienced or dwelling on, or something that's just keeping them depressed and down. You will oftentimes encounter people whose first instinctual reactions will be to basically tell them to suck it up, which is fine, and then to tell them to sort of take responsibility. Now, they don't even need to be trying to assign or place blame anywhere else, but it's a popular thing with people to sort of tell those who are in low positions that it's up to them to take responsibility for what happened and for what happens next. Now, while sometimes this might be said with some sort of air of... Um, moral superiority of some kind, perhaps. You know, the kind of people who like to look down their noses at others and say, well, fuck you. But more often than not, I'd like to think that those who give this sort of talk to a friend or whomever they're speaking with, um, in which they'll tell them to take responsibility, to grab the bull by the horns, and to also understand their own role and acknowledge their own role in whatever their suffering might actually be, is typically done actually with more of a sort of bootstraps mentality. It's not so much you're trying to kick them down, you're trying to remind them that they are perfectly capable of lifting themselves up. Now, the reason I get into this is because there does at the same time seem to be a sort of almost ironic connection between 
the ways in which many other people will attempt to tell others, their friends and their family members and whoever they may be speaking with, that they are the authors of their own suffering and their own redemption, if that may be the case. Now, while this is being said to them, it does seem as though there is a natural sort of human instinct to take consideration of whatever sort of suffering an individual might be going through, that one self might be going through, and to pour over it in ways which bring us to conclusions that it is our fault, that everything that's happened is, is our fault, even in times in which we're wronged by others. Now, this can be especially interesting to observe when you consider it in a romantic relationship context, or more specifically, in the context of a breakup. Now, it can be very easy when one person is perhaps, let's say, a bit more in love with the other than they are with the first person, that when those relationships fall to pieces, one oftentimes will attempt to assume some level of blame, or as much of it as they can in many cases, if they feel like really beating themselves up. Now, it's not just so they can suffer additionally on top of what happened, but it's also because in some cases, in many instances, clinging to this possibly false notion that you yourself were the cause of all of the calamity that came about in whatever relationship that might have been, is easier to actually digest than the concept that perhaps the person that one had fallen in love with didn't really exist. That perhaps it was simply an idea, an effigy created in the mind of the one partner, seeing what they wanted to in their significant other when none of that may even have existed. But all the same, the self-blame aspect seems to be a rather common theme when it comes to people and suffering. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't loads of people who really just sort of live to externalize all blame and externalize everything. All sources of their suffering come from outside of themselves because they themselves are perfect. These people exist. I'm pretty sure we call them narcissists. But all the same, these people exist. And likewise, the, the, the tendency, the predilection to externalized blame in that way is something which exists as thoroughly within most of us, I would say, um, as this impulse to blame ourselves for things. Now, what does all this have to do with self-loathing? Well, because there can be either immediately or down the road, um, cause for some people to assume the blame for the bad things that perhaps happen to them. In the course of them doing such, oftentimes they can find it really easy to sort of get wrapped up into whatever that issue or that incident might have been. Uh, sort of like in the same way in which many speculate that um, you know, clinical neurochemical depression can at times be caused by prolonged uh, exposure. Uh, not so much exposure, but um, prolonged periods of genuine depression brought about by sadness related to something else, and then it just sort of gets hardwired. The brain adjusts and adapts to these chemicals causing these emotional flows, and then you have certain types of depression. Now, this being the case or not, and I'm not a clinical professional, let me just clarify that now. I'm not pretending to be a clinical professional. I'm not even pretending to be an expert. I'm just looking over some of my observations. But the way that this all seems to relate to self-loathing is that as we go through life, many people, many people do have a tendency, perhaps, to, as uh, a songwriter, Ray LaMontagne put it, um, they fail to count their blessings and they choose instead to dwell on their disasters. Now, I know about this person, I've done it myself. But the funny thing is, as we go through our lives, as we go through time carrying this load, we can oftentimes find ourselves so full of self-loathing as a result of our assumptions that we were the authors of those tragedies, that we were the authors of the trauma and suffering that we've sustained, that it can be very easy to slip into cycles of self-abuse, which themselves only really serve to feed the underlying self-loathing, which in turn in an Ouroboros fashion, feeds back into the self-abuse. The way I've seen it work, and the way it's actually experienced it, um, has been 
Much like this, uh, it's rather simple. Uh, tragedy occurs, the, the plight, the difficulty, hardship occurs, and the individual survives it. But they come out, and they're not unscathed. They lost something. And perhaps this can be any of the sort of fundamentals that we'll often hear uh, psychotherapists or psychologists discuss. I've been watching a lot of Jordan Peterson lately. And, um, and he, again, it's much like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But even then, I mean, the concepts of, of financial stability and basic security, um, the kinship and, and socialization, friends and such, kinship like that, um, as, well as, as well as genuine intimacy, genuine partner intimacy between uh, yourself and another partner. These are things which most people, every person kind of, to one degree or another, needs in order to be happy and sustained. Unless, of course, they've you know, sought some ascetic form of enlightenment, in which case it's a different discussion. My point here, though, is that these cycles that evolve or can evolve from self-loathing are pretty terrifying and fascinating at the same time. So you consider it this way. Tragedy falls. Person, person assumes blame, and they carry that around with them. And just like in anybody else's life, in everyone's life, a stumbling block comes along again. Sometimes it can be a big one. Some people are genuinely unlucky. Some people do have to eat shit over and over and over again. And sometimes it's just, it's, it's just misfortune, it's bad fate, but that's what happens. But let's go with something a little less in 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 intense than that, but still the same. So let's say um, a tra tragedy happens. Um, uh, someone loses their job. And they lose their home, and they end up perhaps homeless on their friend's couch, or they're back with their parents, or something like that. So they've had a significant setback in their life. And while they're trying to move forward for, from that, move forward with their life, improve, rebuild, restart, um, perhaps a friend dies, um, or perhaps a, a lover leaves, or perhaps... Um, some sort of strife and drama disrupts the social circle to a point where it, it pretty much dissolves. And this is suffered as another loss by this person. Now, they've already gotten into the habit of assuming blame, even if it's only quietly to themselves. These are people who could be raging to their friends, to their family, to whomever will listen, um, about how awful the plight is, and how if this and that and this was different, everything would be better. But they could still be walking around with all of this self-loathing. So what do they do as these build up? More obstacles, more roadblocks hit them as they move forward in their life. And each time tragedy or disaster happens, uh, to one degree or another, blame and self-blame is adopted. Now this, in time, turns into self-loathing. Because as you look back over the course of your life, if you're not the type who could go for what I guess I believe Nietzsche called it... Um, uh, amor fati, uh, love of one's fate. Basically, it says if you can look back on the totality of your life and say that if I had a choice, I wouldn't change a thing, that's a, a good life. That's amor fati. Um, but, you know, this is somebody who's not in that position. Somebody who, when they reflect or dwell on the bad shit that's gone on, one of their first instincts becomes to assume all of the blame for all of that. Now, once they've done that, they have no one to blame except themselves, and the author of their suffering is staring right in the mirror, and they grow to hate that person, who they are. Now, in many cases, when it comes to things such as substance abuse or self-destruction, the way that these cycles seem to be able to feed back into each other um, seems to work in a way that, so, somebody's suffering, self-loathing, lots of maybe misplaced guilt, no sorts of things. And they carry this around day to day. And it's very easy to try and go and drown your sorrows in liquor. In fact, the rates of alcoholism we have throughout the country, especially here in my state, um, suggest that that's probably a very common, if not outright cliche, way of dealing with things. So once they do this, though, they begin harming themselves, abusing themselves. Or maybe they're going out partying too much. They're having just uh, as much unsafe debaucherous sex as they can, losing themselves in it without any sense of intimacy or connection all the time. It's just physical sensation. It's just, it's just debauched um, distraction, really. But with, with all these, whatever patterns of self-abuse that seem to emerge from these, eventually the results of those catch up to the individual. Uh, if they're abusing drugs or alcohol or substances, the, their internal organs um, and, and their mind. 
suffers as a result. And as they suffer, they pick up on this suffering eventually. Or this suffering causes other suffering that they blame themselves for. But either which way, the self-inflicted wounds then feed back into the self-loathing as the person realizes that the one who is genuinely doing them harm now is themselves. And for that, they begin to hate themselves even more. And so they fall even deeper into the cycle of both self-hatred and self-abuse, which feeds back into the self-loathing and the assumption of guilt and all of that. Now, this all being the case, um, the funniest thing, and I say funny as an odd, it's the kind of thing that when you, when and if you pick it up, and you pick up on it, uh, it, it, it can hit you like a freight train. I mean, Al Pacino said it best, I think, in Devil's Advocate, though he was talking about guilt, and we can apply a similar thing here. He says, it's like a bag of fucking bricks. All you gotta do is put it down. Because one thing that a person can and should come to realize, and then work to really incorporate into their understanding of themselves and their lives, is that more often than not, if you're carrying around old baggage, yeah? Old scars, if you're beating yourself up, hating yourself, regretting and lamenting huge portions of your life for things that happened a long time ago, the important thing to do is to actually examine how pressing that pain really is. Were you in a perhaps protracted legal battle? Um, maybe family courts, something I have experience with. When that battle, when that fight is over, when the abuse, perhaps, of a, of a former partner is over with, even though it's over, it's still scar tissue up in the mind. And it's by working through these scars and realizing that that pain is long gone and that you can stop suffering for it now. I'm not going to say it's cure-all. I'm not going to say it's the kind of thing that'll just, you know, cause someone to just sort of jump, snap shit, and just be a, a healthy, productive member of society once again, free of self-loathing, guilt, and all of that, but it is a rather profound realization for one who carries around old pain like that, to realize that um, quite often they don't need to. In fact, the only thing about the situation that they're still carrying around that's doing them any actual harm is just themselves. It's the dwelling on the negative aspects of things and, and the sorts of almost addictive patterns to pain and suffering and isolation, self-loathing and all of that. And the way these cycles feed into yet another round and perhaps a more intense round of a thing. That once, you, once you're able to actually sort of take a step back and see that from that kind of long view perspective. And again, I'm simply talking from my own layman's perspective on the matter. But once you are able to step back for yourself, as I did recently, and realize that the things that trouble you, by and large, are gone. And there's no need to carry them around and let them continue fucking up your future, allowing you to have future incidents to dwell on long after they're over, ruining other things. I like butterfly wings once touched and never get off the ground. Well, this has been the interesting thing I've noticed about self-loathing, and if there's one thing I've definitely learned, it's that, um, well, life is genuinely full of suffering, and a lot of times you are the author of your own pain. But that is not a reason to drag it around with you, like a lead weight, a millstone around your neck. It's important to from time to time, pause, and if, you, if you're a depressive type, if you're the type who falls into cycles of serious depression where you dwell on your disasters, do your best at some point to take a sort of objective self-inventory. Consider the things that eat away inside of you, the things that cause you to perhaps hate yourself for whatever the results turned out to be. And as you consider these, and as you pour over them, ponder them deeper and, and, and more ro robustly, um, ask yourself how much of those situations, of that old pain, still has any home in the world outside of in your own head. Because you'd be surprised how much garbage we just carry around 
simply if for nothing else than that we uh, can hold on to it as maybe some reminder that we're alive. I, at this point, I'm not even really sure. So I'm going to turn it all over to you guys. What do you think about this uh, this notion of, of self-loathing and self-blame? The, the sort of innate instinct within us, and perhaps an instinct which is driven into us by society to assign blame to ourselves and to derive self-hatred from that in many cases, uh, so much so that it can actually greatly impact and affect otherwise wonderful things that come down the line. What do you think? I mean, do you think that these cycles, do you think there's something to this, or am I way off base? And do you have any kind of experience with this yourself? Have you ever <coughs> taken the time to try and, you know, clean the, uh, clean the, the monsters out from under the bed and the skeletons out from the closet? And if you have, what did you find? Was it was it as simple as just letting go, or was there more to it? So as always, I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me rant and babble on about the shit that's flying around in my head. Um, as always, your comments are appreciated. Let me know what you think. Um, let me know if you think I'm onto something, full of shit, or if maybe you are yourself uh, educated as a clinician. Tell me where am I at. Other than that. Um, as usual, thank you all to the uh, sustaining patrons and my and the subscribers who've been sticking with me. You guys are why the channel still exists, and, uh, <laughs> and I do it all for you, baby. But if you are new to the channel, please hit subscribe, hit like, dislike, again, leave a comment. And if you are so interested in supporting the work I do in any way, there's links down below to Patreon, uh, Maker Support, and uh, also a PayPal tip if you just feel like throwing me a few shekels. Otherwise, there's also a listing for a P.O. box down below and other relevant links, fun stuff worth uh, looking at. So, with that, all being said, make sure to catch me on YouTube Saints every Sunday night at 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific on the channel, link down below. Jeff Holiday and I just uh, well, we do our best to have a good laugh at some of the silly shit we find during the week. Uh, additionally, you can catch us also during the Midweek Saints over on Twitch on Thursdays. A little, a little more informal, and if you're a regular audience member and a member of the Saints uh, Discord, you might even get a chance to just jump on the show and hang out and shoot the shit with us. If not, just jumping into the Discord after the show to shoot the shit with us there. So, catch us on YouTube Saints, and uh, short of that, I guess I'll just see you next time. Don't Hate yourself for fucking off? I really gotta get a new sign off. Hmm, bye. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to anything. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of bitch and talks and lose and start again your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sin to serve your turn long after they're gone and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on.